Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Tuesday, and uh, praise God, we are going to be, we're looking at faith, hope, and love, and today is the last on faith. Tomorrow we'll be starting on hope from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the grace of these is love. So we'll be saving love for last, and um, we'll be finishing up love on Good Friday, which of course is the greatest expression of love the world will ever know, because it's when Jesus goes to the cross, out of love for us, love for the Father, and for our salvation. Praise be to God. So today, um, I want to talk on the freedom of faith, the freedom of faith. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of faith. It is a gift. It's not something that we produce. You have created us, each one of us, with a measure of faith. It's just a matter of where we place that. And so today, Lord, just help us to be fully present, uh, lay aside any distractions, and as we get into your word, Lord, Get into our hearts, minds, and souls through your Holy Spirit in a special way. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the freedom of faith. And I'd like to look at, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Philippians uh, chapter 1. Philippians, and this um, was written by Paul uh, from prison. So um, go ahead and we're, we're going to look at verses 3 through 11 today. 3 through 11. Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 through 11. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He who began a good work in you, in each of us, we are his workmanship created for good works. And um, as I was thinking on the freedom of faith, you know, childlike faith, um, there's such freedom when you look at children and the faith that they have, the faith that they have. So let's look at this a little bit. Um, I want to lift up four ways uh, to where childlike faith can set us free. One is um, humility. I have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn. And when you think of children as they're growing up, they realize there's, there's a lot that I don't know. I've got to learn how to tie my shoes, and then, you know, eventually you get into school, for instance, you've got to learn how to spell and do math. And that, that humility, that desire to learn is kind of built in to children. And when we get to be adults, uh, I remember when I graduated seminary as a pastor, it was like something clicked inside of me saying, now um, I'm no longer a student, now I'm a teacher. I don't have anything to learn anymore. I'm just here to teach. That didn't work out so well. But man, that humility of realizing I have a lot to learn and there is someone who knows worlds more than I do. And if I will humble myself before him, before my Heavenly Father, give him control of my life, he's going to show me so many awesome, incredible things to give up that control. And when you look at Jesus' life, his primary disciples, with the possible exception of Judas, and we can talk about him uh, at another time, 
But his disciples, even though they didn't know what was going on, they couldn't really predict what was coming next with him, they humbled themselves before Jesus, and they just kept walking with him. They kept following him. They kept listening to him. They kept submitting to him. And most people just came to Jesus when they had a need, but they didn't want to become his followers. So they never really experienced that incredible faith that was theirs in Christ. And then there was another group of people, the religious leaders, that were constantly arguing with Jesus. So when we find ourselves arguing with Jesus, we need to back up and say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I have a lot to learn. Please forgive me. And you know, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5 that the only thing that counts, the only thing that matters, is faith in God, faith expressing itself through love. So if we have our faith in the right place, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, love begins to flow out of us. And this is, um, you know, part of humility before Jesus. Why do we forgive everyone? Because Jesus tells us to. That's the simplest answer of all. Why do we forgive? Because he tells me to. And he's the boss. And I have this faith, this freedom, and I don't want to go back the old way, where I kind of have to decide who I'm going to forgive and who I'm not going to forgive. If this slight was so bad that I can't forgive it, or I'm going to hold on to it for a week, Jesus is like, just forgive it. Just let it go. Yes, Lord, you're the boss. Why do we forgive? Because Jesus says so. Period. And that was one of the things when um, our kids were little, we said it's perfectly fine for us to be the bad guys. You know, you have to be home at a certain hour, and if your friends can stay out later, you can make us the bad guys. Well, my mom and dad, they're just completely unreasonable about this, but I have to be home at 8 or whatever it was. Why do we forgive? Because Jesus tells us to. Why do we love everyone? Same reason. Because Jesus tells us to. Why do we pray without ceasing? Why do we go to church? Why do we... Jesus tells us to. Jesus tells, why do we honor our parents? Because the Lord tells us to. That humility. I have a lot to learn. And there's someone who knows a lot more than I do. And I want to learn. Humility. Number two. Another aspect of this freedom of faith, this childlike faith, is I'm not alone. I'm, not, I'm never alone. You know, when you see children, for instance, in the playground, um, sometimes if they, if they skin their knee or something, they'll come over and sit, mom and dad maybe shed a few tears, they're held for a little bit, and then they're right back out there playing. I think a lot of the reason that uh, so many adults take things so seriously is they don't realize that God is with them. I mean, truly with them and watching out for them. So that sets them free to be children of God. If you think you're all alone, you've got to figure all this out on your own, that's a heavy burden. That's a heavy burden. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him because he surely loves you. You're never alone. That's part of being a kid. That's part of the freedom of faith in someone other than myself. Next, I am loved and protected. That I am loved just the way I am and I'm protected. That's a huge, huge gift of faith. When children know that their parents love them just the way they are. And that they're protected. Um, when we realize that God loves us exactly the way we are. And that he is protecting us. He is watching over us. He is going to guide us. He is going to help us. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Reminds me of uh, years ago. Um, just right over here at this uh, sliding glass door. Uh, the kids were outside playing, and I heard a smack on the, on the door. And I looked over, and a crack was starting. And I was like, oh my goodness. One of the kids threw a rock and hit the sliding glass door. So I rushed outside, kind of upset, and there was Wade, just as a little guy, I don't know, maybe four or five years old, and tears were already filling his eyes. And he said, Dad, make it stop! Because we looked up, and it just, it was starting to spiderweb out. These cracks. And, um, praise God. The Lord was with me. He gave me wisdom. 
I could tell my son was really upset by this, and there was no point in getting angry because it was it already happened. So he'll learn a lesson, but let's also teach them lessons about grace and love and forgiveness. And so he said, Dad, fix it. And I said, I'm sorry, son. There's, there's nothing I can do. There's, this is beyond my ability to fix. And he was just beside himself, upset. And I said, son, it's okay, right? Did you learn something? He's like, yeah, I shouldn't have thrown that rock. I'm like, okay. Well, now let's just watch this. Because my guess, this thing is going to spread over the entire sliding glass door. And sure enough, it did. I mean, it was actually kind of spectacular to watch because it just kept all the way, all the way up into the corners, all four corners, the entire sliding glass door. And there wasn't a piece of glass without a crack in it larger than, I would say, even a dime. I mean, it was, it was kind of spectacular. And so we sat there and watched it and we kind of even laughed at it, right? But to understand that our Heavenly Father is with us and He loves us and He's, he's not going to rake us over the coals for every mistake we made. That's why Jesus came. He came to die to pay the price for those. But we can learn our lesson that we are loved and protected and God is going to help us no matter what. The freedom of faith. Praise God. And lastly, there is work to do. See, this is one of the most exciting aspects of faith in Jesus is there is always work to do. Always. He has something for us. Right? Like the scripture says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Right? That's Philippians uh, 1 verse 6. He who began a good work in you. So we're all his masterpiece. And he's been working on us since we were children. Even when we were away from him, we were learning things. Right? We were learning it doesn't make sense to leave God. It doesn't make sense to, to walk away from Jesus. Stay close to him like his first disciples, okay? because there's work to do. And again, it's humility. We don't really know what that work is going to be, and we don't really know how to do it, but he does. So we stay close to him. And that's one of the greatest aspects of faith, is that we matter to him, and he is going to use us for eternal purposes. This life is not about self-fulfillment. It's about denying myself, taking up my cross daily, and following Jesus. It's not about me anymore. It's setting me off to the side, being used by God for his eternal purposes. There is work to do. There is work to do. And I want to share with you a story, because um, one of the truly incredible ministries that God has shown us, and, and the simplicity of it, 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 it took a while to figure it out, but, you know, because we had tried so many different things. Again, trial and error, and, you know, we learn things that don't work. Then, well, that's part of learning too. So there was this challenge of how do you reach men? How do you reach men? And for the longest time, I had said to our guys, because we had a lot of you know, women's Bible studies and things, and, and I said to our men, guys, we're spiritually behind the ladies. We got to catch up. We got to become more and more like our sisters. Come on, right? And so we were using a lot of the same kind of materials and things, and, and it just wasn't working. But... In my devotion time, God began to give me wisdom. Again, I've got a lot to learn, a lot to learn. And he convicted me. He helped me to understand that our guys weren't behind the women as far as spirituality is concerned, but our guys had a different spirituality. Men and women are different, and that's a really good thing. It's a God-created thing. If you don't believe me, um, think about it. If, if a group of guys, a group of gals get together and go to a movie, it's one of the examples I use all the time, I can pretty much guarantee you they will choose different movies. Why? Because we're different. We look at things differently. Praise be to God. So that Sunday, I apologized to the guys. I said, look guys, I'm sorry. I've been saying that that we're behind the women when it comes to spirituality, we're not. We just have a different spirituality, and, and I haven't figured out what that is yet. But pray. Pray. So we did. 
And praise God, um, there's a, a gentleman in our church, Coach Paul, who had been a football coach for 40 years, high school and junior college, and God just kind of moved in my heart to talk with him. I mean, if anybody would know how to motivate young men, and just because we get older doesn't mean the motivation changes, it would be a football coach, a successful 40-year football coach. So I called Paul, and um, I came. he came to my office, and we just talked. And I said, Paul, I know we're supposed to reach the guys, but I don't know how to do it. So what have you learned? How, how did you motivate all these young men? And he said, high expectations. High expectations. He said, I would come, I would actually go into these young men's homes. And he started out in an inner city where a lot of times these young men, it was just them and their mom and, and siblings. And he would go in and he would look these young men in the eye and say, I expect you to come in and be a leader. There aren't going to be any superstars on this team. We're going to give our best and we're going to play for each other. And uh, if we do that, we're going to be tough to beat. And so he sort of shared some of these high expectations he had for these young men. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was awesome to listen to. And so I asked him, I said, so how many young men did you, did you coach? He said, three, around 3,000. I said, how many quit because your expectations were too high? And he said, three. And it hit me like a Mack truck. The reason we had so few men in Bible studies and ministry was not because our expectations were too high. It's because our expectations were pathetically low. Insultingly, sinfully low. Because you read the scriptures, and God has work for all of us. All of us matter. And it's way beyond what I had understood. So Paul and I, Coach Paul and I, we prayed. We prayed for like nine months before we even began our men's ministry. And then, um, you know, there was some, some uh, discernment and refining over the years. But now, you know, we get a group of, of maybe six to seven guys. And you read five or six verses. And the leader isn't the teacher. The leader is the one that draws out the faith from the other men. What do you see? What do you see? And it's the most astonishing thing. It's just awesome to watch as men look into God's Word and their Heavenly Father starts speaking to them and they start to get God's vision of who they are, of how important they are, and that there's work to do. And the work starts in our hearts and the next place that it moves to is our families to become men of God. Men of God. This morning when I woke up, I realized I started a story yesterday and I didn't even finish it. We had a gentleman come from Washington, right? The state of Washington. And he came and he was, um, I, we, we kind of shared the vision of our men's ministry with him where it's just so unbelievably simple. Unbelievably simple. And think about the first, the first disciples, a bunch of fishermen. These are not complicated guys. But they were men. And once their minds and their hearts started connecting with Jesus, they, and they stayed with him, nothing was going to stop them. Nothing. So, anyway, this gentleman, um, he, he uh, got this vision, and he went home. And he started a Bible study in his own neighborhood. And maybe this is something God wants you to do with some of your neighbors over this break. We have a lot of time, right? A lot of people are doing a lot of nothing. Maybe God wants you to start a Bible study in your neighborhood. And he lived like in a cul-de-sac area up in Seattle. And so I talked to him and I said, so how's it going? He's like, well, it's going okay. It's not, not, as, not as good as I would like. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, we've got, um, I've got six guys, six guys from the neighborhood that we, the six of us, we meet um, every week for Bible study. I said, Six guys? He said, yeah, three of them don't even go to church, but they, they won't miss the Bible study. I'm like, <laughs> I said, how, wh why would you possibly be disappointed about that? And he said, well, we, there are these other two guys on the block, and we just can't get them to come. Yeah, yeah. I said, just keep praying for them. But if you get six out of eight guys on a block, 
getting together for a men's Bible study every week. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Praise be to God. There's work to do, and it starts with humbling ourselves before God and listening. One of the other really cool things, and I want to end with this, is, um, you know, if you have kids, um, just uh, pay attention to them. Because God may speak to them about some ways of loving people and caring for them. Children can hear Jesus better than adults because we start getting older and we start thinking we've got to carry the world on our shoulders and we kind of give up on that childlike faith. We think we have to do it, right? Um, and it reminds me of the story one day, um, this is when Noel was probably about five, maybe six years old, and it was a Saturday. One of the things we used to do a lot of Saturdays was we would go out, she would get on her bicycle, put her little helmet on, you know, and we would go door to door, telling people about Jesus, inviting them to come to church. So I was in my recliner and watching some meaningless basketball game. And she comes one day into me and she says, um, Daddy, can we, um, can we go tell people about Jesus? And I'm serious, this was a truly meaningless basketball game I was watching. I looked at her and I said, Sweetheart, can't you see Daddy is busy? <laughs> And she turned around and walked off. Okay, Dad. And then the Heavenly Father dealt with me. It's like, really? Really? She wants to spend time with you? To go and tell people about my love, my son? Are you too busy? I said, no, Father, I'm not. Sorry about that. And I went and found her, and we went out that day. Don't be surprised if your children don't come to you with some really awesome ideas about how to care for people, how to love them. Ask, ask them, what do you think God wants us to do? Who are some people that we can help? Because as I say, that childlike faith, that freedom of faith, they know more about it than we do. Praise be to God. Let me read this again. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. As long as we have breath in our body, there is work to do with Jesus. He's going to use us to love others, to make a difference, to shine that light, the freedom of faith. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you that every single one of us matters. Lord, give us that humility to realize you know more about us and our lives than we will ever know. Make us hungry to listen to you. Help us to re remember that we are never alone, that you're always right there with us, ready to walk with us every day. Remind us again that we are loved and protected, that you are with us, you always are with us, and you'll correct us, but there's no condemnation. And Lord, help us to realize that even during these times, there's work to do. There's work to do. So open up our hearts and minds, speak to us, and lead the way. We love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you forever for this gift of faith. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night, and I uh, hope to see you tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. God bless.